Last time, I survived 400 days with the Create mod in Hardcore Minecraft, and pretty much right after that video came out, a brand new Create update was released. Based off the comments, it seemed like you all wanted to see even more, especially with the new update, so this time, I survived 500 days with the Create mod in Hardcore Minecraft. Be sure to like and subscribe if you enjoy the video. With the brand new update installed, I spent day 401 running around the base looking for pretty much everything that was broken. I figured the elevator might not be working properly since the superglue functionality had been changed, so I pushed the button and, as I suspected, just nothing moved. Or so I thought. Really, the top block did move, but it didn't take anything with it, so I brought it back down and cleared out some space around the elevator and just re-glued the entire thing together. After replacing all the blocks around the elevator, I stepped in and gave it a quick test run, and it seemed it was working perfectly now. Next thing I noticed was my storage system was backed up, and after a quick inspection, I realized that none of the mechanical arms had any inputs or outputs, so I just picked each one of them up and reset them. Unfortunately, I already knew what was coming as I ran around the corner to just see my entire power generation setup destroyed with the removal of the furnace engine. I spent a bit of time mourning the loss of one of my favorite builds in this entire world before moving on as this one was going to take a little bit longer to fix. Day 402 was also spent checking the remaining contraptions for potential issues. I grabbed some iron and andesite before heading up to the mechanical mixer setup just to do some trial runs and right out the gate there seemed to be an issue since the items were not even leaving the chest. I spent a bit of time running around trying to figure out what was broken before I realized the redstone somehow got messed up for the andesite alloy section. I went into the back room and noticed that the toggle lever somehow got left in the on position even though it had no enabling input and was also getting a disabling input, so I simply chalked it up to the update messing with something super weird and flipped it back to the correct setting. Much like the storage system, I also had to reset the mechanical arm for the blaze burner fueling and just closed up the back area before attempting another test run that thankfully worked perfectly. I let the system run for a fair bit of time just to make sure that nothing else would break and after a while, I felt pretty confident to say it was in fact just the update that somehow messed with the system. I finished off the day by checking the last few builds in the base for problems and thankfully didn't manage to find anything else that needed to be fixed. With the most pressing issue being my lack of power generation, now that the furnace engine was gone, I spent day 403 starting to craft out everything I would need to make multiple high-tier steam boilers in place of the old setup. I took a bunch of copper and iron and gold ingots all to the high-speed press up at the mixing setup since I was going to need a lot of different kinds of sheets to craft pretty much everything I needed. Once I had a few stacks of copper sheets and one stack of both iron and gold sheets, I headed down to the storage area to start putting them to good use. I crafted a bunch of blaze burners to heat the boilers, fluid tanks to actually build the boilers themselves, and then steam engines to attach to the boilers to generate the power. I remembered I already had a lot of fluid pipes crafted, so I grabbed those from the old storage area and then used some cogwheels to turn three of them into mechanical pumps. I needed brass casing to finish off all the crafting, so I put the new casing crafting to good use and placed down some logs, stripped them, and then converted them to casing just by clicking on them with brass ingots. It was definitely a bit slower than the old crafting process, but was way more cost effective, which I was pretty excited about. My last bit of crafting for the day was then using the new brass casing I just made to craft a bunch of display links. On day 404, I slapped on my gold helmet in place of my engineering goggles since it was time to travel to the nether to fill up all the empty blaze burners I had just crafted. When I got into the nether, I went to look at the minimap for directions as I typically do because I get lost easily, and I didn't see any minimap at all. Apparently, I was completely oblivious to the lack of the minimap for the first three days of the series, so I quickly enabled it again, and we can all just pretend that that didn't even happen. Chances are you didn't even notice too, so I can't take all the blame here. With the minimap back on, I managed to find the pathway that I dug to the nether fortress, even though all the waypoints were gone, and I just started my lengthy trek over. Once I got to the nether fortress, I snagged a few stray blaze here and there that were just chilling inside the hallway, before making my way over to one of the only blaze spawners that was on the far side. It took 
ages for the spawner to spawn in 14 more blaze for me to capture, but about halfway through day 405, I had managed to fill up every blaze burner and was finally ready to head home. I went out of my way to kill a few wither skeletons in hopes of getting a lucky skull drop, but as I'm pretty sure everyone would expect, I got nothing and just decided to go home anyway. I made it back through the portal right as the sun was setting and took the elevator back down into the base since apparently my nether portal no longer feels like the one inside my base is suitable for return trips. The next day was just another general prep day. I started out by making a ton of rose quartz and using my freshly enchanted sandpaper to polish all of it. I managed to make it through 24 before I had to do a little bit of trading for experience to repair the sandpaper, and with that, I was actually able to finish polishing all 56 rose quartz. I made some more iron sheets and then used those to turn all the rose quartz into electron tubes, and then used those to make a lot of display boards to go along with all the display links that I made earlier. With all the crafting done, I went over to the old furnace engine setup and just tore into it with my wrench. I'm not gonna lie, it was a bit of a tough moment for me, but it had to be done at some point. Once most of the old stuff was cleared out, I dumped everything into a chest to clear up my inventory, which had become a complete mess. Day 406 ended with me removing the last bit of now useless belt system and grabbing a few stacks of cobbled deep slate to build with. Day 407 marked the start of the steam boiler assembly. I started out by messing around with a few different placements for the blaze burners and the steam boiler and eventually settled on a 3x3 of blaze burners one block into the ground with a 3x3x4 of fluid tanks over them. I put a single steam engine on the side of the fluid tank to convert all of them to a steam boiler and then I placed down another 7 steam engines with 4 running down each side. I put down a few fluid pipes for pumping water into the steam boiler and then put down shafts running vertically for each of the steam engines to attach to for generating the rotational power. With the steam boiler now fully assembled, it needed water, so I tried out a few different setups for pumping water in and settled on one with all three pumps next to each other, which, spoiler alert, wouldn't end up actually working in the end, but we'll get to that a little bit later. I used some gearboxes and cogwheels to connect the rotational power from the steam engines to the pumps so the system would be self-sustaining once it started, and then I cleared out the area around the blaze burners since I wanted to be able to see them whenever I eventually finished the setup. The next day I realized, in pretty typical rage fashion, that I in fact had not crafted everything and actually needed mechanical arms for automatically fueling the blaze burners, so I ran up to the mixers to grab some brass and gold sheets and then went to the precision mechanism assembler to convert a single gold sheet. As per usual, I had to sit for a while and wait for the system to loop five whole times, but before it could do that, it ran out of cogwheels. So I crafted up both regular and large cogwheels to refill it using their new cheap recipes. With the system refilled, it finished crafting the precision mechanism and I crafted the mechanical arm. I spent a decent chunk of time just trying to plan out where I wanted the mechanical arm and corresponding depot to sit and adjusted the gearboxes so I could run a cogwheel over to power the mechanical arm as well. Once I was happy with the location, I had to break the bottom layer of the steam boiler to actually set all the blaze burners as outputs and then set the depot as an input and place the arm and the tanks back down. On day 409, I figured the system was good to start testing since it had water input, fuel input, and should be self-sustaining once it got up and running, so I grabbed a hand crank and slapped it on the pump cogwheel. On my first try, it overstressed the entire system because everything was all connected, so I disconnected one of the pumps and the mechanical arm, and the hand crank started working. Unfortunately, I was still an idiot and rotated both pumps when only the first one actually needed to be rotated, but thankfully water somehow still managed to make its way into the steam boiler just really, really slowly. With water in the system, I placed down the third pump, reconnected the mechanical arm, and eventually fueled the blaze burner. Unfortunately, the water that had been in the system, and I swear it was there, was no longer there, and nothing happened. So I gave up on the idea of a manual start and crafted some water wheels to power the pumps initially. I spent way longer than I should have hooking up the water wheels to power the pumps, but eventually it got working, only to realize that with all three pumps directly next to each other, they would suck up all the water right away. I went back to the drawing board and eventually ended up with a staggered pump setup still being powered by the water wheels behind the walls. 
The new setup worked pretty well and managed to bring the steam boiler up to a tier 7 boiler, but was still being limited by the water as shown in the diagram. Ideally, all three light green lines would match, so none of the three variables are limiting any of the others, and therefore nothing is actually going to waste. Since I had so much rotational power to work with, I finished off day 410 by adding a rotation speed controller, cranking it up to 256 RPM, and connecting it to the pumps. This wickedly overfilled the water, but that was actually perfect since soon I'd be splitting it between two different steam boilers. Now that the first steam boiler was up and running, I wanted to make a second one, but quickly realized I didn't have enough blaze burners, so on day 411, I crafted a bunch more and went into the nether to fill them. As expected, it was just as boring as the first time since the blaze take ages and ages to spawn, but by the end of the day, I was able to head back to the portal and take the elevator back down to the base again. With the new blaze burners ready to go, I spent the next day duplicating the exact steam boiler setup directly next to the first one. I made sure to mirror the initial setup so all the rotational power would meet in the middle from both and could easily be combined and transported anywhere else in the base. I ended up having to disconnect a few parts and assist in the manual startup yet again since the assembly process had shut down the first steam boiler, but eventually both got water and started running and I was able to just reconnect everything. Based on the steam boiler info, it appeared my setup managed to perfectly align size, water, and heat to make two tier 9 boilers with absolutely nothing going to waste. Days 413 to 415 were mainly spent setting up the fuel transportation from the chest to the depots. I started out by making some adjustments to the position of the rotational power transportation since I didn't really like how it looked and didn't want it to impact the belt line I was about to set up. After making the adjustments, I dug down and reconnected the gold generator since it had been sitting idle for a really long time now and I finally had some rotational power to work with. Once it was back up and running, I dug out a line for the belt system right in front of the depots and placed down the shafts and belts that I would need. I spent a bit of time trying to figure out how to get the belts rotating in the proper direction without looking completely awful before just giving up and deciding to use weighted ejectors instead. I set the weighted ejectors to output to the depots and hooked up rotational power from the first belt in the system to both the ejectors themselves and the belts bringing items to them. Since I needed items to go evenly to both ejectors, I placed down two brass tunnels and set them to round robin. The fuel was now making its way onto the ejectors, but I noticed the ceiling was way too low and was blocking even the closest ejector from getting its fuel onto the depot. I cleared out the first layer of the ceiling above the ejectors and it fixed the issue for one of them, but the further one still wasn't even close to being able to make it. I spent the rest of day 415 clearing out layer after layer after layer above the steam boilers until finally both ejectors were able to successfully toss fuel to the depots without any problems. The next three days were aesthetic building days since the mechanics of the setup were actually already done and I was in fact still planning on listening to all of you asking me to make my builds look nice. I can't say they'll actually look nice, but I can at least give it a shot and it seemed like last time you really enjoyed that. I used tiled deep slate for the flooring and built up the siding with stripped spruce wood, but took a really long time to decide just how tall I wanted to make the area for the steam boilers. I filled in the back of the area with polished andesite just to break up all the dark colors that I had used so far with something a little bit lighter. After stepping back for a second, I figured a less cramped area would probably look best, so I built everything up to meet the ceiling. Once the walls were built up, I switched out the tiled deep slate for more stripped spruce logs on each side and filled out the ceiling with cobbled deep slate, moss, and a tiled deep slate ring around it. To finish off the build, I did what I usually do and placed down random barrels, lanterns, and grew a bunch of glow berries, and eventually, I was actually super happy with how everything looked. Day 419 and 420 were a little more low-key as I wanted to blend in the new build with the area around it. I took tons of cobbled deep slate and used it to fill in all the empty space around the steam boilers. I also replaced majority of the stone and granite and other random blocks on the walls with cobbled deep slate as well. 
It took a lot longer than I expected initially, since I was never satisfied with how far out I had blended everything in, but I called it quits at the end of day 420, since I was getting really tired of just pillaring up repeatedly to work on different sections of the ceiling. With the entire steam boiler setup now done, I used day 421 to start setting up the display board to project all the information from the setup. I decided I wanted to hang it from the ceiling, so I cleared out an area in front and above the steam boilers and replaced the visible stone with cobbled deep slate once I had enough room. I put down some chains to hang the display board with and then built out a 5x4 display board. I cleared out all the scaffolding and ended up having to pick up a fair bit of blocks that had now clogged up my belt system after just accidentally falling onto it. I started out day 422 by running rotational power from the steam boilers all the way up to the display board since it would in fact need power to actually display anything. I wanted the cog wheel powering it to be in the top middle block between the two chains since I figured that would look the least weird, I guess. So it took a little bit of digging around to get the rotational power there, but eventually the display board was powered and ready to get some data input into it. I planned on displaying lots of stress info about the system, so I dug down to the rotation speed controller before the gold generator and put down a few stressometers in place of shafts. I linked multiple display links with the display board so that they could transmit data and then put them down on the stressometers. In the end, I labeled the first line steam boilers using a name tag and then showed a visual display of the consumed stress units, the total stress unit value, the consumed stress unit value, and finally, the total percentage used. Maybe it wasn't the most useful information, but it definitely looked super cool. Day 423 was a crafting day since I was planning on working with trains soon and I wanted to automate the production of train tracks. Luckily, I had plenty of deployers left over, so I didn't have to craft them, but I did have to craft a mechanical press and a mechanical saw. I grabbed a few extra gearboxes I had lying around and crafted some more cogwheels and water wheels for when I inevitably had to make a compact and convoluted rotational power setup to run the entire thing. With my inventory full of mechanical components, I spent day 424 clearing out a small area behind the gold generator. I made a gradual slope down using cobbled deep slate with the goal of eventually making an actual staircase once I wasn't feeling so lazy. I leveled the ground out, cleared out a bunch of the lush cave vegetation, and filled in all the random pockets of water. Once I was happy with the general area, I started digging a bit into the wall so the setup wouldn't just be sitting out in the middle of the path, and I finally replaced all the visible blocks with cobbled deep slate and moss. On day 425, it was time to set up the train track crafting, so I placed down two shafts to run the belt on and a mechanical saw at the very start for producing slabs. I slapped down two deployers and a mechanical press over the belt system and set the deployers' filters to iron nuggets. I placed down more shafts and ran a second belt behind the deployers to fill them with iron nuggets. I put down two barrels with andesite funnels to output items onto the belts and eventually I switched out the iron nugget andesite funnel for a brass funnel so it could output a stack at a time. I put down brass funnels to input into each deployer and set the filter to iron nuggets for those as well. With majority of the assembly steps ready to go, I crafted some andesite slabs and set them as the filter for the mechanical saw. To finish off the setup, I placed down a final barrel with an andesite funnel to collect each train track as it finished getting crafted. Day 426 was spent hooking up the rotational power to the entire setup. I dug a small hole in the wall behind everything and placed down four water wheels for power and then ran the power out to both belts and the mechanical saw. I was initially super excited since I managed to get both belts running in the correct direction and hooking everything up was extremely easy. I gave the system a quick test run and it worked perfectly, but it was a bit slow so I crafted some more cogwheels to gear up the speed at least once. After getting everything reconnected and running in the proper direction, I covered up the mess of cogwheels and shafts and gearboxes and put some of the new placards on the barrels to show what went where. I probably could have just used signs, but I figured I'd try to use all the new stuff from the new update, and this was one of them. I dropped in a bunch of andesite and iron nuggets and just let the system make more train tracks than I'd probably ever need. The next day I started out by having to make a quick fix to the steam boilers. I crafted up some additional steam engines and fluid tanks since each steam boiler needed one additional engine to output its max stress units. 
In order to keep the same style I had, I built up an additional layer on each steam boiler and added the new steam engine and shaft to the back row, bringing the overall stress unit output up by about 30,000. When I stepped back, I happened to notice the gold generator was actually missing some crushing wheels and a mechanical press and losing about one fifth of its output. So I quickly crafted up everything that was missing and finished off the day by replacing all the crushing wheels and the mechanical press to bring the gold generator back to its former glory. I still have no idea where they went to this day, but I'll probably never find out. Day 428 was a cleanup day since I had left a little bit of a mess around the base as I was building new things. I hauled inventory after inventory from chests in front of the steam boilers and the train track auto crafting to the storage room so the base didn't get too out of hand. I'm going to be honest, it took ages to move everything since the blocks were extremely random, but ideally it would help me not to overcraft a ton of water wheels or andesite funnels and all that good stuff when I already had plenty of them laying around ready to use. By the end of the day, I had finished and was able to get rid of the chests in front of both setups. I spent the next two days mapping out a rough idea of where my train tracks would actually go. I crafted a bunch of polished granite and started placing it down running around the large pit at the far side of the base. It honestly started off pretty tame, but got a little treacherous as I got over the lava and would take a pretty solid fall if I did any misstep anywhere. I even had some extremely annoying run-ins with water since apparently every single ounce of water in this entire cave is trying to make my life as hard as possible, but eventually I made it around the pit. I decided it would look cool to have the train partially visible at times and hidden in the wall at other times, so I continued to map out a few more areas between the lava and andesite generators and between the steam boilers and mixing setup. It would definitely be a pain to connect these, but at the time that was future rage's problem. And let me tell you, Future Rage definitely eventually hated Past Rage for this. Day 431 was a very odd crafting day since I only made two very specific items. I started out by checking the recipe for different train blocks and it turned out I needed sturdy sheets, which were not simple to craft. I went to the lava generator and repeatedly filled up a bucket and used it to make a few blocks of obsidian. Once I had four blocks of obsidian, I took them down to the ore processing setup to crush them into powdered obsidian. This recipe is super weird on its own, since 75% of the time it doesn't consume the obsidian, so I ended up sitting there for quite some time before all four blocks of obsidian were gone. I took all 18 powdered obsidian to the lava generator and put them on the depot to be filled with lava as the first step in the assembly process of the sturdy sheet. Things got a little bit messy as the depot got overloaded, but I had plenty of room to snag all the sheets and take them to the press to finish the last two steps of the assembly process. Once the sturdy sheets were finished, I took some gold sheets and processed a bunch of those into precision mechanisms. With the sturdy sheets and precision mechanisms, I was able to craft train stations and train controllers, which would be required for the next build. I spent day 432 prepping the area I would build the train in and ideally make the first train station. Before starting to terraform the area, I got a sighting of the extremely rare blue axolotl you guys always comment about that apparently I was oblivious to. I'm not really sure how rare it is, but apparently it's very rare, so it sucks I'm gonna destroy its home. After shedding a quick tear for the axolotl, I proceeded to clear out the granite that I had placed down and put down some cobbled deep slate to level the ground out. I started digging into the wall to have some additional room to work with, and since I'm me and nothing ever changes, I hit a massive pocket of water right behind the wall. I spent the rest of the day trying to fill in enough of it so I'd be able to move the wall back a few more blocks without having water spill out quite literally everywhere. The next day was also spent working on the soon-to-be train station, but thankfully didn't include any underwater building. Once I was happy with the initial size of the platform, I placed down a straight line of train tracks and put the train station at the very front facing away from the rest of the base. I finished off the day by sitting and crafting multiple crushing wheels since I love how they look on trains and didn't have any extras laying around. On day 434, it was time to start building the train. So I clicked create a new train and used train casings to make four bogies on the track. I used the stone cutter to make a few variations of cobbled deep slate and got to work. 
This process was honestly just a bunch of trial and error, but I did have a general idea of the shape I wanted since I had made a few trains prior to this. In the end, I used a lot of random blocks like crushing wheels, plows, and even item vaults to get a unique style that I felt matched the area pretty well. I even tried using the whistle because I like the noise it makes, but sadly, it just looked wrong, so I settled for using chutes in its place. At the end of day 437, the first part of the train was done, and I was so happy with how it turned out. With the first part of the train done, I used days 438 to 440 to assemble the second carriage. I wanted to give the train an actual purpose, other than just looking cool, so I decided to make an item transportation carriage. I started out by building a very basic foundation around the last two bogies, and then went and crafted a ton of item vaults, which really just meant that I sat at the press for a long time waiting for iron sheets. Once I had plenty of item vaults, I spent a while trying to figure out the proper size and orientation that would make them look best as part of the train. I settled on two 3x3x3 three by three by three item vaults and added in some details like andesite ladders going up between the two vaults. An obvious oversight here was the lack of storage interface on the actual train to take items into it, but I'd figure that out later. At the end of day 440, I did some trading, enchanted my super glue, super glued everything together, and assembled my very first train in this world. Going into day 441, I was thrilled to have finally built the train, but that meant I had to start clearing out the pathway for the train tracks, and that was gonna be a less than fun or quick process. Over the course of the next five days, I cleared out the entire area I marked around the pit from the train to the steam boilers. It ended up using over half the durability of my pickaxe since I had to make sure the pathway was both wide enough and tall enough to not look stupid with the train passing through. To nobody's surprise, I did run into a few situations where water was again my mortal enemy, but in the end, it wasn't so much a hard process as it was a tedious one. To close out day 445, I did a quick run through of the entire area I had just cleared out and I was super excited to start getting to run train tracks through it. I would say that the next three days were less painful, but that would just be a flat out lie. As I said, I went in super excited to put down all the train tracks that I had auto crafted and had now cleared out a ton of space for, and even started out the day by making more at the auto crafting area just to make sure I had more than enough for the entire looped track. Unfortunately, right when I started placing down the tracks, I realized it was going to be rough. The pathway I had made wasn't totally suitable for the curves and height changes required for the tracks, so I had to clear out even more space than I initially planned just to fit the tracks in. The process of placing the tracks and then going back to clear out the area to actually fit them in kept repeating all the way until I made it to the steam boilers and used up all the space I had cleared out. At some points, I even hopped in the train and moved it along the tracks to make sure the ceiling wasn't a problem, and as it turns out, it was, and it tried to kill me. So I had to hop out and increase the height of the ceiling as well. Because of course, there is no way this process could just be an easy one. It just had to be extremely hard. At the end of day 448, I had managed to get the tracks all the way around the pit and wouldn't die using the train on them, but was dreading the remaining part of the build, since quite honestly, this should have been the easy part. Having seen that my plan of clearing out an area and then placing the tracks after wasn't really working so well, I decided to take a new approach on days 449 to 451. I started clearing out smaller areas and then attempting to place down the tracks for those specific areas before moving on so I could plan a bit better than before. The tracks bend in such odd ways that it was hard for me to visualize it both bending and changing height without actually having the tracks right in front of me. Over the course of the next three days, there was a lot of trial and error with removing tracks and placing them back down in slightly different spots, but I managed to get the tracks past the steam boilers and heading towards the mixing setup with a little bit of the track popping out of the wall, which looked super cool. Day 452 started out with me doing some trading with the Fletcher since my pickaxe had seen better days and needed even a slight amount of XP to repair it. This project was putting it through the ringer. I also grabbed some cobbled deep slate and replaced some of the walls around the opening by the steam boilers since it looked a little bit out of place with the outside being cobbled deep slate and then the inside being a bunch of exposed stone and other random blocks. 
Once this miscellaneous stuff was done, I got back to working on the track, and after clearing out a bit more space, I marked a waypoint so I could tell where the end of the tunnel was. I dropped down from the opening and also made a waypoint between the andesite and lava generators, since my plan was to connect the train tracks from the first waypoint to the second one behind the wall. I figured having two points of reference to just kind of blindly dig towards would probably be helpful. Right as the day was ending, I got back to working trying to place down more tracks and made a little bit of a rough discovery when I mined a block to find out the mixing setup and its redstone was right in front of where the tracks needed to go. If you couldn't already guess, days 453 and 454 were also spent building the track. Oh my gosh, it's so exciting, right? I'm sure this is getting old at this point, so I'll try to keep it pretty brief. I managed to adjust the tracks so they cleared the mixing area just barely and continued on and mined a relatively straight tunnel towards the waypoint at the lava and andesite generator. Once I got to the waypoint, I realized I had to lower the tracks a fair bit, so I placed down a pretty steep slope and cleared out all the blocks in the track's path. I cleared out a bit of the area that would be open looking out over the base, but seeing as day 454 was coming to an end and my pickaxe was on its last legs, I decided it was a good place to take another break. Day 455 was another chore day that started out with me cleaning a lot of the junk out of my inventory and doing even more trading to try desperately to keep my pickaxe alive. If I'm being honest, this pickaxe had come closer to dying more times in this 100 days than I have during the entire series. Once all the random chores were taken care of yet again and my pickaxe had a bit of new life in it, I got straight back to clearing out the rest of the open area by the generators and finished wrapping the tracks around inside of it. Over the next three days, I cleared out the remaining area going down from the lava generator to the first train station and I was so excited once I finally popped out at the bottom. Admittedly, there was some annoying water to deal with since that huge pocket of water next to the train hadn't been dealt with yet, but it was small potatoes compared to all the work I'd done so far. I slowly ran the tracks down through the new area, making additional space for them wherever they needed it, but when I got to the final curve, the worst thing I could possibly think of happened. No matter how hard I tried, I couldn't connect the two tracks together. The curve was too tight and couldn't bend properly to connect no matter how I moved it or what I did. At this point, I had been recording for a few hours in a row, constantly working on the train project, so I decided to take a break at the end of day 458 and would hopefully return the next day with a new solution that would actually fix the issue. I came back on day 459 with a new plan that would hopefully work but it was going to require a bit of adjusting. To make sure I was fully ready to go, I did even more trading with the Fletcher to repair my pickaxe a bit yet again, and then started clearing out more space by the train station so the slope would be more gradual for the tracks. Once I leveled out the bottom area slightly and cleared out a lot further back into the wall, I was able to find a place to put the tracks down. I tested to see how high I could make them go at this point and managed to gain one additional block of height which might not seem like much, but it was a huge win. With this track placed down now, I knew where I had to connect the upper portion to, so I mined away more of the wall and shifted the slope going up to the track to be more gradual before attempting to connect them again. Thankfully, this time it finally worked, and I was able to complete the loop for the train. I still had a fair bit of cleanup though, and as I was mining away blocks covering the track, I realized it cut right into the magma wheels powering the lava generator. I'm going to be honest with you guys, day 460 was quite possibly the most embarrassing day of my Minecraft career, but I'm going to leave it in here so that everyone can have a good laugh. I had to fix the magma wheel situation, and my plan was simply to shift them over a few blocks to avoid the train tracks. I figured moving the first two water wheels would be sufficient, so I picked up the lava and used the wrench to grab both so they didn't fall in and burn. I cleared out some space on the other side of the remaining magma wheel and tried to place down one of the ones I had picked up, not realizing the lava flowing down the back of it would reverse its rotation, thus breaking it off and burning it. I hated myself at this point and went to craft another water wheel to replace it since I needed all of them. With my new water wheel in hand, I picked up all the lava to try and avoid this happening again and used the opportunity to extend the shafts 
and reconnect the water wheels to the lava generator. I place back down the two water wheels and then place down the lava, but again, one <laughs> broke and it burned. <laughs> now I really hated myself. I ended up recrafting more water wheels and finally realized I was being a moron and had to block the flow of lava behind them entirely. And on the third try, I managed to get them working. Nobody will ever speak of this day again. I spent the next three days doing the mundane yet arguably important job of replacing all the visible stone inside the open tunnel portion of the train track, or I don't even know what you call that or you know what you wouldn't call it, but the area where you can see the train passing by with cobbled deep slate since the outer walls were made of that. I kept having to step back and look to see if I had replaced enough and spoiler alert, I almost never had, but by the end of day 463, I felt pretty happy with how both openings looked. On day 464, I noticed my storage system was getting backed up, so I went over to clear it out and get it running again. When I started moving items, I saw a fair bit of wood was making its way into the garbage chute rather than going over to the steam boilers and becoming fuel, which was a problem because I was actually slowly draining my fuel supply at the current rate. I mined back to check on the filter and found out the tunnel was only set to let oak wood through to the steam boiler and not spruce wood. I grabbed a filter, set it to allow all types of wood through, and slapped it down on the tunnel. I sat at the tunnel for a bit just to verify the change actually fixed the issue, and from what I saw, it looked like the problem was solved. I filled the area back in, did some trading again to repair my pickaxe, and started gathering resources from around the base to do the crafting for my next build. The next two days were crafting days with a bulk of the time for the first day spent simply waiting for tons and tons of crushing wheels to craft. You'd think with how often I make these, I'd speed up the mechanical crafters, but at this point, the sitting and waiting almost feels like tradition. Once the crushing wheels were done, I crafted a bunch of encased fans and mechanical drills. I made a bunch of extra andesite casing since my first batch of drills wouldn't be nearly enough, and in the end, I crafted 60 mechanical drills, hoping it would be sufficient. I finished off the crafting by making some cog wheels, gearboxes, and a ton of electron tubes for smart chutes and brass tunnels. I finished off day 466 by dumping all the mechanical components I crafted into a chest by the train and starting to clear out the vegetation around the area. I spent day 467 building up the terrain so it was closer to being level with the train platform. I used stacks and stacks and stacks of cobbled deep slate to fill in everything and even had to make a quick trip to the tunnel bore unloader to refill on it after I used everything I had. In the end, it wasn't super pretty and it definitely wasn't blended in well with everything around it, but the area would suffice for the time being. On days 468 and 469, it was time to start building. In case you couldn't already guess from the items I crafted, I was going to make an iron generator. One that is so much larger than the one I made in the first 100 days. I started out by placing down a basin and running a belt directly into it. I cleared out some space behind the belt and put brass funnels pushing items onto the belt. I mined one more row back and placed down encased fans pointing at each of the brass funnels. These fans would wash the gravel and push the iron nuggets and flint into the funnels and onto the belt. I shortened the belt length once I found out how long it actually needed to be. I placed a smart chute under the belt right in front of the basin to eventually discard all the flint and place down a pair of crushing wheels over every encased fan brass funnel combo. Turns out I was a bit short on crushing wheels, so I just cut off the end of the setup and filled in the space with cobbled deep slate. I put a brass funnel leading into the basin and then put chutes down over every pair of crushing wheels to drop the cobblestone directly into them. I finished off the main portion of the iron generator, similar to how I did the gold generator, by placing a bunch of short belts pushing into the chutes with brass funnels and brass tunnels on each. With the processing portion of the iron generator complete, I spent day 470 making the cobblestone generator. I had to build up from the ground a decent amount since the input for the cobblestone was at the top of the setup, but it wasn't as bad as the gold generator, so I guess that's a win? I did the exact same setup as I did for the gold generator, with two belts on either side of a stream of lava and water on the other sides of those. In the end, I had four belts total and placed mechanical drills over each one. 
Having remembered the prior issue the gold generator ran into, I placed down a chest with a brass funnel on each side to collect the cobblestone and output it in stacks of 16 to not stall out the tunnels, which were in fact much slower than the funnels at both inputting and outputting items. Day 471 was another chore day since I was getting too distracted by these huge projects for chunks of days at a time. I started out by making some additional andesite casing and crafting up some encased chain drives along with making some extra cog wheels and shafts for when I eventually had to hook up the rotational power for the iron generator. Once all the crafting was done, I did some more trading to yet again try and revive my pickaxe, but even after getting some XP, it was still hanging on for dear life. As I made my way back to the iron generator, I noticed the andesite generator was clogged up somehow, so I grabbed the items in the basin a few times and even took the extra flint off the belt since it seemed to be backing up the system. After clearing out the backlog one last time, I dumped all the junk in the lava. Except I failed, so I dumped it in again for real this time. Apparently, the update just threw a bunch of my systems out of whack, even though it didn't outright break them. I finished off the day by bringing all the random ores that I had mined while clearing out parts of the base over to the ore processing setup. The next day was fluid day. No, seriously though, I know it sounds gross, but I had made the entire setup for the iron generator and had yet to fill in any of the needed water or lava. I spent majority of the day hauling lava over from the lava generator to randomly grabbing water from around the base to fill in both the cobblestone generator and the washing area. Once the lava was placed down, I covered it all in glass because seeing how poorly I dealt with lava earlier, I was not taking any chances. Once all the fluids were in place, I took a bunch of filters and set all of them for iron nuggets and flint before filling each one of the brass funnels with them. This would prevent any unwashed gravel from making its way onto the belt and would also allow for stacks and stacks to be pushed up against the funnel, washing at any given time. Day 473 and 474 marked the final stage of building for the iron generator as it was finally time to connect the rotational power. Over the course of the two days, I painstakingly experimented with how to connect everything in a not completely ugly fashion while having it rotate in the proper direction. Thankfully, I was able to just pull power directly from the gold generator and therefore the steam boilers, so I didn't have to worry about generating actual power for the system, but my god was connecting everything a huge pain. It's not like that's anything new though with big setups like this, it always seems to be a huge issue. One critical step was making sure to use a rotation speed controller to greatly slow down the drills from the 256 RPM the rest of the setup needed because otherwise they would have the issue of phantom breaking cobblestone and shooting it all over the place. With that taken into account and everything running properly, I noticed there was still a backup on the cobblestone belt, so I implemented a second chest much like the first to collect cobblestone and only output stacks of 16, and that seemed to fix the issue right away. To close out the day, I realized I hadn't hooked up the encased fans and now had stacks and stacks of gravel sitting in water, so I quickly hooked those up and got them spinning in the right direction to push the gravel onto the belt, and boom, I had my iron generator. I started out day 475 by adding in some cobbled deep slate and moss to the area around the iron generator to blend it in a bit more with the cave around it. I also used andesite casing to put covers on majority of the exposed shafts and cog wheels. After stepping back and feeling pretty content with how the area looked, I dumped a bunch of stuff into the chest and built out the track behind the train in a straight line so I could align the carriages and disassemble the train. After disassembling the train, it was finally time to put a portable storage interface on the back carriage so the train could collect the iron and take it to the storage room. I could not find a perfect place for it, so I settled for replacing the bottom middle block of polished andesite and the andesite ladder with the portable storage interface. Once it was in place, I reassembled the train and drove it forward a little bit so I could remove the straight line of tracks behind it that I no longer needed. With the train ready to accept items and the iron generator running, it was time for me to move the items about 20 blocks, which was going to be a monumental challenge. I placed down the portable storage interface and thankfully it connected with the train one. 
I placed down a depot in line with both that portable storage interface and the basin, and then ran a belt under the depot and the interface. I put down a chest in the middle of the belt with a brass funnel on each side to sort of act as a buffer when the train wasn't at the loading station. Once the loading area was done, I got rid of the storage chest for the iron next to the basin and instead had it output to a weighted ejector that would throw it onto the depot. Unfortunately, I didn't have any rotational power readily available for the loading area, so I chose to just put a water wheel underground to power it to avoid having a long line running all the way from the iron generator over. Everything was working well, but I totally forgot I had to actually leave space for a funnel into the interface, so I moved the depot back one and extended the belt so I could move the chest over. Finally, the setup was done and the iron was successfully loading onto the train. Day 478 was a cleanup day since I had left another set of chests full of junk in front of my new build. I started hauling items from the chest to both the storage room and the old chest up by the bed. Eventually, I'd have to empty the old chests and replace them with something else, but that would be a project for future rage. Once the chests were fully organized, I finished off the day by doing even more trading for emeralds I'll likely never use in an effort to get my pickaxe even just above 20% durability. Having loaded up the train with plenty of iron, it was time to find a place to drop off that iron, so I ran around the track searching for the correct spot that was good for a train station and close enough to the storage room. I settled on the straightaway near the mixing setup and cleared out some extra room on both sides of the hallway so I had a bit more space to work with. I placed down another train station at the very end of the straightaway before it dipped down and went to take the train for a quick spin just to see where everything stopped at the new train station. From the looks of it, the interface wouldn't line up perfectly with the belt system and would end up colliding with the mixing area and the storage area if I tried to run a chute down from it. I spent day 480 solving this issue by adjusting the position of the train station and train tracks just a little bit so I could disassemble the train and add in a second interface on the exact opposite side. I reassembled the train and moved it forward so I could fix the tracks that I had momentarily messed up. I cleared out some extra space on the other side of the train since the drop-off would now be over there, crafted another interface, and slapped it down against the wall. Once I knew where the items would be coming from, I started digging down in a diagonal to see where a long chain of chutes would eventually drop the items. I made it to the belt system after doing some digging straight down at the end and placed down a chest that would act as a buffer chest for the iron if the belt was too full. I had to run some trials to see if chutes would hold items off a full belt even on a diagonal, and unfortunately, they did not. The next day, I solved this new issue by moving the chest and placing down another diagonal set of chutes along the belt to drop items on the flat belt connecting to it. I figured a single chest would be sufficient, so I added in a buffer chest randomly in the chute chain and then built all the way back up to the interface with a long line of diagonal chutes. Since I can never catch a break, it seemed I was off by one block, so instead of adjusting all the chutes, I just moved the interface and the train station so the train would sit correctly to match the new position of everything. I went down to check if the iron in the train was making its way into the storage system, and I was thrilled to see tons of iron flowing along the storage system belt line. Day 482 started with me checking how much iron had built up in the chest as I was working on the train at the second station, and I was happy to see about four stacks in the chest. Since more iron was building up and clearly needed somewhere to go, I took the train back to the first station after it was done dropping all the iron off that it had. With the train loading back up, I cleaned out my inventory and grabbed some of the sugarcane I had torn up when making the train and replanted it around the base. I am always short on sugarcane, and I was not about to forget to replant it another time. As per usual, I did some more trading with the Fletcher as well, and my pickaxe was now back at 50% durability, which was actually really surprising. To finish off the day, I used some stone and deep slate to build around the exposed chute system and try to blend it in at least a little bit better with the area around it. On day 483, I took the elevator to the surface to find pretty much any fuzzy animal that could control my new train. I figured a wolf would probably be the most likely nearby candidate, so I brought a lead and some bones with me. It only took a bit of running around and cheating using the entity tracker on the minimap to find a wolf, tame them, 
and bring him back to the elevator. Once I got him down into the base and over to the train, I used a trick you all told me about and attached a lead to them and then clicked on the seat and boom, the wolf was on there. It was so much easier than trying to somehow shove them in the train myself. Now that I had something to control the train, I made a train schedule and messed with it a bit before I settled on slowing the train down to 50%, going to the unloading station and leaving when the train contained less than one item, then going to the loading station and leaving when the train contained more than 200 items. I tossed this to the wolf and they immediately left the station with me inside the train. After looping around once, it seemed like I did something wrong since the train never stopped, so I grabbed back the schedule in a desperate attempt to just stop the infinite loop. Over the next two days, I experimented with different settings for the train schedule and mainly adjusted the item count setting to trigger the train leaving each station. I realized you could set item filters for the item counts, so I put that at iron and the train worked perfectly. The only downside was once it made it back to the filling station, it took ages to fill up with 200 iron, so I eventually knocked it down to 96 iron, and then finally 64 iron, just so the train would run more frequently. With the train running smoothly and plenty of iron coming into the storage system, I used day 486 to speed up the mechanical arms in the storage system. They were starting to miss items since they were too slow when the belts got full, so I crafted a rotation speed controller and tacked an additional water wheel onto the current setup powering the mechanical arms. I got rid of the cog wheel speeding everything up and switched in the rotation speed controller, which I connected to the arms and cranked all the way up to 128 RPM. I would have gone higher, but it actually couldn't handle the next speed without more water wheels, and quite frankly, there wasn't much room left to add more in. I also made some small adjustments to the storage room when I noticed I had doubled up on the nether block chest and didn't have any chest for andesite alloy. While I was messing around with the storage system, I had noticed I was running really low on zinc, and since my tools were still hanging on at low durability, I figured it was a perfect time to bust out the tunnel bore and get some ores. It wouldn't really be a 100 days with create video if we didn't use the tunnel bore at least once, right? I took all the supplies down into the mine and cleared out a large area to place down the tunnel bore. I could definitely feel how slow mining deep slate was without the beacon. I'm just going to be honest, it, it was the worst. Once the space was cleared out, I placed down the rails and the cart assembler, adjusted the setting to lock rotation, and slapped down the tunnel bore. I cleared out a bit more space around the tunnel bore once it was down, and funny enough, I actually found diamond while I was doing that. On day 488, the tunnel bore was prepped and ready to go, so I fueled it up with plenty of coal and hopped on the back to assume my position as the resident torch placer. For the most part, it was a typical trip with me just sitting watching ores pass by, knowing I'd get to mine them soon enough, but at one point, lava somehow stayed in the tunnel due to some weird thing with gravel on the walls, and so I actually had to pop off the seat and clear it out. I'll admit, it gave me a bit of a jump scare, because I never expect anything bad to happen, but I didn't step away from my computer or anything like that, so I was able to deal with it no problem. Could you guys imagine me dying while on the tunnel board trip because of lava while I was AFK? That would be a pretty rage way for the series to end. I'm going to be honest, I'd expect nothing less of myself if I died in this series. Other than that, I let the tunnel bore run all the way to the end of day 491 before I picked it back up as I still had a few things left that I wanted to do before the end of the 100 days. I spent day 492 mining all the exposed ore on the way back through the tunnel. There was actually a surprising amount of exposed diamond this time around, but I wasn't complaining. The funny thing is, diamond might actually be the most useless of all the ores I could possibly find, but it always still makes me happy when I see it. I checked my inventory at the end of the tunnel, and it appeared I mined around 9 to 10 stacks of random ore, which I could not wait to process solely for the XP nuggets. I made my way back to the base on day 493 and took everything over to the fancy tunnel bore unloading area. I placed down the tunnel bore and watched as the system did its thing and sorted out all the items for me. Making this was definitely a huge time saver, so thank you to all of you guys who pushed me to do it a few videos ago. Once all the items were sorted, I took the ore I mined and the raw ore the tunnel bore got and dumped it all into the ore processing chest. 
While that whole thing was working, I made a barrel and grabbed a brass funnel and set them on the back wall of the unloader to collect the rails that I kept getting dumped in the lava. I probably should have done this before I unloaded everything, but I honestly forgot until I watched them get discarded in the lava for the second time. I'm sure you were all raging since you were the first time around as well, but hopefully you'll get some comfort in knowing it shouldn't happen a third time. On day 494, I ran around the base and grabbed all the ender pearls I had, along with the blaze rods I had sitting over by the scuffed potion brewing setup. I crushed down the rods and crafted 21 eyes of ender, which I hoped would be sufficient to find and open the portal with. There's no way I find a portal with no eyes in it and use a ton to get there, right? Right? I did some trading for XP and crafted a new bow with the intention of enchanting a better one than I fought the wither with. I used all the XP nuggets I had from the ore processing and did a bit more trading to get to level 30, which kind of ruined my plan of repairing all my tools, but either way I was ready to enchant my bow. Unfortunately, it only got power 4, so I just combined it with my old bow and called it a day. The next day, I grabbed a bed in case it took multiple days to find the stronghold and took the elevator to the surface. All around, it was a pretty uneventful trip, but I did take a lot of detours to kill as many chickens as possible because I didn't really have any arrows and I had no infinity bow. My hope was I'd have at least 64 feathers by the time I found the stronghold and could use the 64 flint and 64 sticks that I brought with me to craft up enough arrows for the entire fight. My aim isn't that bad, probably. Even if it is, my editor can just cut the bad parts out, so I guess you'll all never know. Around the end of day 496, my Eye of Ender went into the ground, so I dug a spiral staircase down and was honestly surprised at just how low down the stronghold was. It's been a while since I've actually done this, but I don't recall it going nearly that far into the ground. I am super bad at exploring strongholds and can't even remember the rule with the direction of the doors, but the minimap made it pretty easy just to tell where the portal room was. Day 497 marked the start of the dragon fight that you have all been asking for for the last four videos. The day started out strong as I had found a completely empty portal, which is exactly what I would expect. I filled it in and hopped inside. My first shot was absolutely perfect, 100% success rate so far, but let's just say that didn't continue the entire time. We can just go fast forward through the countless shots I took to clear the crystals, but I can confidently say that eventually, I did get all of them. I hit a few shots in the dragon before they perched for the first time, and I managed to get a lot of damage on them then. I loaded them up with shots yet again as they came to perch, and as usual, I went in to get even more hits on them. I got them super low, but because of that, I got pretty greedy to get a few more hits, and I got knocked up so high into the air I could barely see the ground. I obviously, in typical fashion, panicked and for some reason pulled out a gold apple before attempting to switch to a water bucket way too late to MLG clutch anything, but the fall only did about two thirds of my health. Feather falling really saved the day and quite frankly, the entire series there. I sniped the dragon with a few more shots and boom, just like that, I was victorious. It was a tough fought battle, and I definitely think I did it in record time. I collected all the experience, which somehow managed to land me at 69 levels, grabbed the dragon egg, and got the heck out of the end. Since I had broken my temporary bed, I came back at spawn and ran to the elevator as the sun was setting. Since I had now traveled to the end, it only seemed appropriate to use day 498 to add in a chest in the storage room specifically for end blocks. I picked one of the two remaining chests with no set items in them and tacked on a filter for every kind of end block I could think of, including ones I'd probably never even get. I put the filter on the funnel and then took all the random junk inside the chest and chucked it on the belt to either be turned into fuel for the steam boilers or just ditched in lava. This motivated me to do a bit more cleaning of my chest, so I moved a bunch of random stuff from the old chest to the appropriate storage room chests. While I was doing this, I also noticed I had two chests for sticks, which is like, what the heck is that? So I changed the second stick chest to be for planks and stairs and slabs and all the random wood blocks I craft way too much. Once I set the new filter, I moved all the sticks to the first stick chest while dumping a bunch of wood stuff into the new wooden item chest. 
With only one day left, I couldn't really start any big projects, so I used the start of day 499 to make a little area for the egg in the storage room. It wasn't anything super fancy since I tried to blend it in with the same block palette I used for the room overall, but it at least gave me a place to put down the egg and added some cool detail to the room. Once that was all situated, I crafted a bunch of cobbled deep slate slabs and used them to level out the area around the iron generator and the train station. It usually seems like such a small thing, but in the end, I find it always makes such a huge difference with how natural the area looks. I used stacks and stacks of slabs to fully blend in the area, along with a lot of moss to give it some life, and by the end, I was happy to sign off on how the entire area turned out. As day 499 came to a close, I watched as the train pulled out of the station and took a trip on the track that put me through so much pain to make. It was definitely worth it in the end. And with that, it was day 500. Another 100 days were complete and I couldn't be happier with how everything had turned out. Be sure to let me know in the comments which build was your favorite and if we should go for 600 days next.